Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls of all ages, welcome to the world premiere of Clean My Mix here on GarageBand and Beyond, a brand new series I'm gonna start doing where I take a look at your actual GarageBand project files and tell you what I think about the mix and hopefully have some ways to help you improve that mix. I also wanna say thank you to everybody who sent in songs over the week it was really fun to get to listen to your guys' music and all your recordings and stuff. Very, very fun for me. I just wanted to reiterate that I need your actual GarageBand project files, not just MP3s. I need an MP3 and the GarageBand project file. I don't think I said those two things in the video, but it was in the more info area of last week's video about this topic. So anyway, just remember, I need both of those, the project file and the MP3. And on that GarageBand project file, if you could please zip that file before you email it to me, that will make it uh, better. <laughs> you guys, let's get started. Today we're gonna work on a song by a guy named Trevor Sanders. What's up, Trevor? Thank you so much for sending in this song. The song itself is called Let Yourself Be. One of the reasons that I chose this particular song is that he recorded real good old fashioned drums, which I thought would be fun for you guys to look at and for us to discuss. Um, I know it's, it's always fun for me when I get real drums to mix, so that's why I chose this one. Uh, also, good song, totally great song. So let's get to it right now. So the first thing I wanna do is just help you guys understand what you're looking at here. So these first four at the top, these are drums. This is a drum bus, uh, which, which I, uh, okay, we'll, we'll discuss your busing option here, Trevor. Uh, me personally, I wouldn't have done this and I understand why you did do it and maybe it has something to do with the fact that your computer could possibly be slow, but I wouldn't do it. And what I mean by bus is that he basically soloed these four channels and he did it with the vocals too. He took these four channels, just the drums, let me push play. just those drums, he summed them down to this one track and then added some reverb. Okay, um, so let's keep going down the list now. So here we have a drum beat being played by a drum machine. This is the bass track. This is a loop or a bunch of loops, I guess, right out of the loop library, which is a road sound, sounds like this. Okay, uh, cool thing, a little bit slower than it was originally played, but it seems to work somehow. Uh, we got a keyboard sound here doing dream voice. We have some effecty things here, like this is a reversed something, or maybe it's a symbol. This is uh, an 80 synth rising. Here's a reverse symbol. And then down here we have all vocals. And once again, we have another vocal bus, okay? So these are the parts. The thing I wanna start with and tell you why is the vocal and drum bus in general. Trevor, like I said before, perhaps you are doing this because of the fact that your computer runs slowly if you're putting all the reverbs on all these tracks. I kind of doubt it though, because the reverb that you chose to use, uh, let's take a look at it here, is this AU Matrix Reverb, which is right out of GarageBand. The nice thing about using these GarageBand plugins is that they are not very taxing on your system, at least on my system. So in this case, where you're just gonna blanket all of these tracks with the same exact reverb, which is, again, not something I always recommend, um, one of the things that you're gonna have a problem with in, in the way that GarageBand works when you start summing vocals or anything, you end up with the tiniest amount of phase inversion. Um, it's not great, It's not. there's not a lot of it and it's not very, very noticeable, but it's an issue. So I wouldn't make this a habit, this summing thing here. So basically what's going on is you're playing the same exact track at the same exact time. This one just happens to have reverb on it. However, if you listen to this with the reverb off, um, which we will do right now, Let's uh, get your automation up, make sure I'm in a good spot to hear this. Okay, good. So let's just listen to this with this bus turned on, but the reverb turned off. What I want you guys to listen for is sort of a tunneling effect that's gonna happen. 
this is a clear sign. If this is something that you're hearing, if you like are using stereo microphones to record an acoustic guitar or piano or something like that, that's one of the areas where you would most commonly run into phase inversion problems, but also this method of like layering tracks that are exactly the same. Let's just listen to it and see if we can all hear it, okay? I know I can hear it. Let yourself be. Let's solo this to make it a little easier. Okay, that's not the right one, this one. Let it go and set yourself free. Okay, so I really hear it in the inhales. Like anytime you take a breath, you can hear like a, like a swirling sound. Take a listen again. Let yourself be. Let it go and set yourself free. Right there, for sure, in that, the, the free, right? Right there, I can hear it swirling, which is right away telling me that there's a phase issue here. Okay, so that basically means that, you know, when you listen to this in mono, these vocals are going to sort of get a little bit buried. Um, it means that the left and right field is not going to be properly balanced. Um, it just means that these tracks are interfering with themselves. It just, it's not good, okay? There's all sorts of good information out there on the internet about phase inversion. If you want to learn the nitty gritty details about that, look it up. Phase inversion, very, very fascinating acoustic phenomenon when you're doing stuff like this. Okay, so how do we fix this, Trevor? Let me tell you now. Okay, so you like this reverb. Here's what I would do. I would come up here and I would save this reverb. I don't know if you have changed any of the parameters in here, but let's say you did and you like the way it sounds. Clearly you do. I'm gonna come up here and say, save as. I'm just gonna call this Trevor Burb, okay? So now it's saved, okay? So now we don't need this and we can just come into your vocals here and we can open up that same one. It was the AU Reverb. So we need to go to Apple and AU Reverb. I believe that was the one, correct? Trevor Verb, boom, there it is, okay? So now I could just go around and put this on all the vocals and like I said earlier, this is not a very heavy plugin at all. So it shouldn't really matter. And hopefully I'm not, you know, I don't know what your computer setup is. So hopefully I'm not like really telling you something incorrect right now. Um, if your computer's really running slowly when you turn on all these reverbs, then maybe this is, well, it's still not the ideal way. Maybe what you want to do is figure out exactly which ones of these vocals really need reverb. Maybe they don't all need the same exact reverb, okay? So um, that's one thing I would switch right away, okay? Um, it's a great song, I do wanna add that. Let's, I'll let you listen to it a little bit here. So that's what the song sounds like. I don't want to play it too much. Um, anyway, so I like this song, by the way, Trevor. Very, very cool song. One thing that I did also notice here is in, in these lead vocals here. Okay, so take a look over here. They are panned. This is the lead vocal, not the backups or anything. They are panned a little bit left and right. In fact, I believe they're, okay, negative eight and plus eight. Totally fine conceptually. Um, good idea. The only thing that I hear going on is I believe they're at separate levels, right? So this is negative five, and that's at negative 2.6, okay? So 
when I was listening to this this morning, I noticed, I was like, hey, cool idea about the left and right thing for lead vocal. However, I would put them at the same volume level, right? Uh, maybe this was an oversight. I do believe you had to like remix this without GarageBand plugins, but I would, you know, I would just bring these ones up to uh, the negative 2.6 range. So let's just do that for you now. And it's probably the same thing here, okay? So now the vocals are at the same level. Let's just take a quick little listen, see if that sounds better. When you find you're losing faith in those around, just remember they can never get. Okay, so yeah, that, that makes a little more sense as far as the mix goes. Now, another thing that I see you doing, Trevor, is bringing out the volume here, right? Where you have nothing going on. Now, there are two things you could do here. Me personally, what I would tend to do is just drag this thing back and then boom, there's no information there to even bring out with volume. So you don't even have to bother with the automation uh, in this sort of case where you're sort of just trying to get rid of this dead air. Just cut it out. It will make your projects run more quickly. Um, it's just less information, like zero information that GarageBand has to keep track of. But even though there's nothing there, GarageBand does keep track of it. It'll keep your projects running more quickly, more smoothly. Now, the other thing is, so you have this little bit here in the middle. One thing I would do, uh, like for this, if there's a ton of these tracks, I would use the good old fashioned noise gate. This noise gate is pretty good. Um, it can be kind of interfering on certain kinds of tracks, but on here, totally fine. Um, so I would just turn on the noise gate and I might set this to like, let's say 30, negative 30 dB. Let's take a listen. Uh, let's actually, and let's go back and turn off this automation. Okay, so let's hear what we could hear now. Let's see if the channel's running. When you find you're losing faith in those around. Okay, so that's with the noise gate on. Let me turn it off and we can listen and see how much sound there is in these dead spots. Sound. Okay, there's a little bit. It almost sounds like you might be, <laughs> sounds like you might be keeping time with a pen against like a table or something there. So yeah, there is stuff that you don't want to hear, obviously, in that little mix, uh, in that little section. So I would just, boom, turn on the noise gate, problem solved there. Uh, okay, so let's keep moving here. A couple things I heard, uh, the bass, I think, is a little on the excessive side, on the low. Now, Granted, I can sort of already tell you want like a big heavy bass sound on this track. So um, that's fine. We can retain that heaviness. But one of the things I would be worried about with this particular bass tone, and let's listen to it before I get too into it. Listen to how heavy this is. Stormy waters always tend to rock the boat. Just stay the course and you will. So when I listen to that in my monitors, especially, it is very, very sub heavy. One of the things that I would be afraid of uh, is if someone was listening to this on, say, like I have one of those, uh, the Bose Bluetooth speaker, which tends to be a little like sub heavy, especially on something like this. Actually, I should have listened to it just to see. I could imagine this sort of distorting smaller speakers um, that try to recreate bass heavily. So one thing I would do, very, very simply, I would come in and just looking at the controls here, you look pretty good. What I would do is pay attention to this EQ that you have created here, okay? So what I see is that you have bumped up the, where are we here? This is at 66 Hertz, okay? So you're actually pretty close to the secret number, which is around 60. Um, but one of the things you're doing and what you should notice is when you pull this thing up so much, you're actually affecting the high pass filter that you have here. See how this white curve here is now being illustrated. This tells you that this those two are interfering, okay? So what you really wanna do is, we'll maybe roll this guy a little bit more forward Okay, and we want this to basically be shutting everything below 50 off, okay? So let's just shove it at 50. Let's just leave it right at 50, which that is there, okay? 
Um, then the next thing I would do is come back here and I would set this at 60 and just a tiny bit, right? So it's not affecting the high pass filter anymore. Do you see that? You don't have that like extraneous white thing coming up, right? So just a little tiny bump at 60 hertz will do a ton of wonders across the board. But like, you know, I'm talking sometimes like half a dB boost, right? If you see the gain control right here, it's at 0.2 or sorry, it's at 2.5 plus 2.5 dB. So this might even be a touch too much, but I know you want it to be heavy. So let's leave it at two. Let's say that's a nice middle point and let's listen to it. Okay. We'll keep yourself yeah. Okay, so that's the low end of this bass tone. Let's look at the high end of this bass tone. So obviously this is a keyboard part. Um, you know, it's a MIDI instrument. But if you hear that high end stuff, I can tell that you're most likely with this particular EQ move that you had going here, you might be trying to get some of that growl out of this tone, which I totally understand because it's a cool sound. So let me show you exactly how I would find this, okay? so. It's right there, okay? So around 740 hertz, that's where I hear it. Now, it's too loud, obviously. This is a 19 dB, it's quite a bit. So I would just do something like this. That's probably okay, somewhere around there. So now we've moved it to 800 hertz and it's plus five dB. Let's listen to it in the whole mix. Be so cruel, you know, and it's hard to tell if it's a friend or foe. We go to battle like we have to win. All right, so that is a quick look at the bass. Now, as I know, I'm approaching the like 18 minute mark here. I need to uh, start wrapping this up. So you guys, just so you know, it does look like we're going to be doing one song per video here. It just takes too much time, especially in a song like this. Now, next thing, let's listen to these drums because they were very pretty. Well, yeah, they were pretty well recorded. Um, I would say a couple of things about these recordings, Trevor. Um, a tad on the low side, just a tad. It looks like you might also be using a compressor on the way in, which uh, if I, maybe you are, I don't know. Do you have four external compressors or some way to compress on the way in? Um, maybe you are, maybe you're not. I don't know, hard to say, maybe not. Anyway, I would say that these signals look a tiny bit on the low side. Um, you might work with a little bit more proximity, um, just experimenting with the proximity of your microphones to the drums. They don't always have to be like right up on top. Depends on the player, depends on the room, depends on lots of different things the microphones you're using. However, I would suggest that perhaps you experiment with the proximity of the microphones to the drums themselves. Okay, so that's it. These basically sound pretty good though, I will say. A um, couple of things I would do uh, to helpfully help you improve this. Yeah, sounds pretty good. One thing I would do, I think this snare might just be a little bit on the dark side for my personal taste. Now, when you have tracks that are pretty well recorded like this, um, especially this snare track looks pretty good. Um, I have good signal and you know, it's between the 50 and 25% mark here for most of it, except here we get a couple peaks, which we could probably live with. I love the preset EQs for snares and drums in general. Okay, so let's look at the EQ you have going here. This is yours. You look like you got some weird, I don't know what is going on in here, <laughs> this 200 range. But let's just solo this, uh, dr this particular drum, yeah. 
Oh wait, that's all the drums. Hold on, hold on. Let me just solo out the snare. Okay. I'll turn the CQ back on. Okay. So let's come up and look at the presets because I bet you anything that the drums are here. Uh, let's just do clean up my snare. And let me look, are there any other snare ones? Rim snare, ringing snare. This is not a ringing snare. So let's just do clean up my snare. Let's listen to this. I like that better already. Let's hear it in the whole mix. You hear that? Now it's got a little bit tiny of a, a like that crack sound of a snare. You can hear those bottom snares a little bit better um, just by bringing up a little bit of the high end. And I don't know how much I would change this, to be honest. And it's hard to okay, so that's that. I mean, I would go to this cleanup snare EQ and tweak it as you need. I think it sounds pretty good right out of the gate. Let's take a look at the compressor you're using. Okay, good. You do have a snare compression going on. So we'll just leave that the way it is, assuming it's doing its job. Let's look at the meter here. You might be able to bring this threshold in a little bit more, just a tiny bit. Yeah. See, you hear you get a little bit more of the punch out of the snare. Let's listen to it in the whole mix. Let yourself be. Yeah, that snare sounds way better to me now. Um, okay, uh, the other thing is the kick. Let's take a quick look at the kick here. Okay, so now just looking at this compressor, I would say that maybe you're using a little bit too much on a, on a kick drum. You want them to breathe, obviously. You want them to be able to do a lot, but you don't want it to overdo it, right? Um, so I would just dial this back to here. And see, I bring that threshold back and I instantly hear more low end out of that kick. Right, let me turn it back up. Turn it down. Yeah, just it's the slightest difference, but it's it's some of that sub uh, some of that sub information coming out of that drum that, you know, you don't want to lose necessarily. Right. It's a kick drum. We want it to sound boof, poofy, boomy, big. Uh, so you do have modern kick on here. Which I think is OK. It might have a little bit too much of a slap for me. Let's look, let's listen to low end kick. I like this a little bit better. Um, I don't think there's so much of that high that the beater hitting the head sound. I think you have plenty of it in the recording itself. Let's listen to it in the whole mix now, just out of curiosity. Okay, I think it sounds better. Okay, so um, one thing also, Trevor, I would I would say to you is that you have these all set to zero <laughs> across the board, which is you know maybe okay uh, for you, but I would um, not do this personally. Um, these also you're sort of running out of headroom at this point, so uh, you know like the vocals even seem a little bit low, the lead vocals. So they, there's some headroom here. You have negative two point six. One thing I would say you could probably do um, is just take these all and like bring them down to like, I mean, let's just say negative four point, well, where, where do we land? Negative 5.1, I can live with that, okay? This kind of method I have been using a little bit more lately where I bring these things down just to give myself headroom across the entire mix, right? So when I go into, you know, 
I'll, I'll get the drums here and then I'll add all the other parts in and suddenly the drums will be a little bit too low, right? So let's listen to this. Let And, and even if you read this meter for this snare, like you can see how much you're going over uh, and, and up into this headroom that I'm trying to create. Let yourself be. Which makes me wonder what the compressor's doing. The compressor is adding a ton of gain. Ah, oh wait, is this? Okay, this is at invert phase to stereo. Why would we do this? Uh. A, this isn't a, a stereo recording. Um, I don't know if we need that. Let's listen to this. No, I don't think you need that. There might be a piece of information I'm missing why you decided to use this, but... I don't hear any phase inversion issues um, at all with this particular recording, so don't need this. Let's get rid of that, okay? So this compressor is adding a ton of gain. Um, I did make a video about this. I think it's like how, or, or, or are you using your compressor wrong? This is one of the this, uh, telltale signs that you are, is that if I turn this off, it's killing the gain, right? So, uh, let's bring this down. Somewhere around there, negative 13, okay? That sounds pretty good to me. Let's read the meter now. Okay, so that uh, right there is gonna interfere with your gain structure. Um, this would become an issue mostly when you got to the mastering stage uh, because this, like, for example, just this stare was totally driving and peaking this one channel. Out of curiosity, let's hear this whole mix now. Okay, so I did have to bring the overall volume back up um, of that snare, but it sounds better. It's a little bit more concise and precise. Uh, tonally, I think it sounds a little bit more snappy and cool. Now, one thing I would say, Trevor, also, I would maybe just experiment with a little bit of reverb solely on the snare, not on the overheads. Um, I think the overheads sound pretty good, all things considered. Yeah, I think they're pretty good. Now, okay, so like I said, just a little, just a tiny touch, and maybe it's just going to be the ambience knob. Let's just turn this up and listen. Let yourself. Yeah, I think just a touch of reverb on here might be nice. I'm not exactly sure which 
Uh, but yeah, I would experiment with a little bit of reverb on this, okay? So uh, that's the bass, that's the drums. We talked about your backup vocals and stuff like that. I will quickly talk about your lead vocal tone. I do think, let me listen. When you find you're losing faith in those around. It's actually pretty good. Totally nice. Find you're losing faith in those. Well, now, if I look at the meter on the compressor, you can tell that it's not really doing anything. So let's bring that up. When you find you're losing faith in those around. Okay, and we're going to have to go in and change the uh, gain control here now. Because see, what one of the things, as you see, I'm turning this up. It will... I don't like that it does this, but it does, uh, as I control this, it does the compression threshold and it turns the gain up. I don't know why it has to turn the gain up. Um, I understand why, but I would personally bring this down a little bit more. And let's listen to that. Fit in those around. Let's go back. Uh, where this Waters always tend to rock the boat. Tend to rock the boat. Tend to rock the boat. Okay, so it's not too bad, the difference there. Um, a little bit of gain increase out of your compressor is okay. But that much, I personally don't like because it will, again, end up sort of messing up your gain structure. Your overall gain structure will suffer, um, I think. Uh, I don't like to use compressors as a way to boost gain sometimes, especially in a lead vocal, because you get too many other artifacts that the compressor is bringing out. This is just my personal taste on vocals and uh, compression. But anyway, now we have one that has been done and one that hasn't. When you find you're losing faith in those around, just remember they can never get you down. Stormy waters always tend to rock the boat. Just stay the course and you... Do you hear the difference? Okay, so this is the one that I just changed the compression on. This is his stock uh, vocal. There's a huge difference between these two now. When you find you're losing faith in those around Just remember they can never get you down Stormy waters are Okay, so here's what I would do, Trevor, now that I've done this. I would just duplicate this track uh send it what was it negative eight so we're gonna say eight here we're gonna grab these vocals and boom just drag them up now they should be the same when you find you're losing faith in those around wait levels are different negative 2.6 uh, 2.4 i can live with that when you find you're losing faith in those around Just remember they can never get you down Stormy waters You hear it? It's a little bit more, there's a little bit more of the breathy tone. And I didn't change the EQ at all. This is all because of the compressor. And the compressor is not like cranking on that gain again. Um, just be careful about using compressors as gain control. Uh, they're not always going to work in your favor. So I think that about covers everything. Um, you know, this is a good song. It was really fun to take a listen to. So Trevor, thank you so much for sending this in. I hope that something that I have shown you will help your mix get better. Um, and if you guys, if you have any suggestions on how I can make this series better, please, please, please let me know what I can do. Um, it's fun. I, you know, I like to open these up and take basically a quick look at it, go over it and identify the parts for myself and, and figure out what I would change and then, uh, show you how I would change it and hopefully give you a better overall mix. Um, but anyway, if there's something I can do in this series, uh, that you'd like me to do, 
something to make it better, let me know. Otherwise, you guys, thank you so much for watching the very first episode of Clean My Mix. Like I said, I hope something uh, I said was helpful and you learned something today. So have a wonderful, wonderful day. You guys send me your mixes to be featured in these videos and I will uh, hopefully get to it. And uh, I get lots, I did get a ton of submissions, I will say. I got something like 35, 36 different songs, something like that. Um, so it, it, you know, there's a lot of you out there who want to do this. So thank you. I'm, I'm flattered and I hopefully can get to all of you. Anyway, have a great day. Peace and love, everybody.